Hello, my name is Jonathan Ward. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm going to talk to you about uh, transportation of animals regulations that have been changed. These regulations are a part of the Health of Animals Act. And uh, the Health of Animals Act is uh, the act that uh, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency administers, um, which governs or, or deals with a lot of the, the way we, uh, we manage livestock in Canada and, and disease control. So um, my responsibility is uh, I'm the manager of livestock and field crops with Perennia based in Nova Scotia. Uh, I've been doing this since uh, March of this year. Prior to that, I was a beef and sheep specialist for Perennia for about 10 years. And before I joined Perennia, um, I, full, I farmed full time with my wife in central Nova Scotia. We had 350 breeding ewes. And uh, at one time we had 30 head of beef cattle too. We sold uh, the cattle just prior to BSE and concentrated on, on the sheep and uh, some custom farm work that we did. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about uh, the transportation regulation changes that were made to the Health of Animals Act. Um, so these uh, changes um, were, uh, were started or consulted for a number of years uh, prior to uh, their changes. And uh, these regulations also are parallel to another uh, transportation code that is administered by the National Farm Animal Care Council. Their code is similar to the code that uh, practice that we have for beef production. They're currently reviewing that code. They started the review in 2018. They plan on having uh, the code available for consultation in 2022 and being completed in 2023. So while their regulations are to a certain degree voluntary, depending on what province you're in. The Health of Animals Act is definitely not voluntary. There are rules and regulations that are very similar to any other law that we would have in the country, um, like you know the highway regulations and speed, speed regulations. So why are they changing the, the Health of Animals Act and the transportation regulations? The current regulations were established in 1977. And we've certainly seen a lot of changes since 1977. There's been a lot of research into transportation of animals. And at the same time, societal expectations have changed significantly. I was in university in 1977 in agricultural college. And I can honestly say I cannot remember anybody using the words or, or talking about animal welfare um, to any great extent. You know, there was lots of discussion about good husbandry and good husbandry practices, but animal welfare itself wasn't a, a topic of discussion like it is today. And certainly, you know, we know that uh, our customers and, and the people that, that buy our products have uh, significant expectations with regard to how we handle our animals and, and treat them. And it's a very contentious issue. And we need to make sure that, uh, you know, everything that we do um, or everything that we can do to, to ensure the welfare of these, our, our livestock is absolutely critical to a successful farming operation and, and a successful industry. So the current changes to the transport regulations um, are there to, or have been put in place to uh, um, reflect our, our current understanding of the science uh, related to animal welfare, um, to meet some of the expectations that society has in terms of the way we look after and handle our animals. And then we're also, um, trying to have regulations that are similar to our trading partners. Because if our standards 
um, don't closely uh, tie into what other uh, trading partners are doing with regard to production practices and welfare, then it can become uh, a non-tariff trading barrier for our products to, to go from our country to another country. So we want to eliminate you know, any problems that may evolve as a result of having different regulations. So, you know, it is a big deal to, to change our regulations and, um, you know, anytime there's change, people get concerned and, and uh, I certainly, you know, personally share those concerns and that's why I took an issue and interest in this whole issue and invested a, a significant amount of time trying to understand what those changes are. Um, having said that, you know, I, I really think that uh, the changes that are being put in place um, probably, you know, for the, the majority of producers will not have a huge impact in what you do. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, the regulations are, are actually changing, the regulation changes are actually a good thing. So when are these changes starting or when did they start? The new regulations were put in Canada's Gazette Part 2 in February 2019 and they were slated to come into effect in February, 2020. So the regulations themselves are actually in effect right now. And we've been you know, following them for 10 months, I guess, almost. When they were first gazetted in 2019, um, Dr. Kamal, who is the chief veterinary, indicated at that time that the period between February 19 and February 2020 um, should be a transition year that uh, you know, producers could use to prepare for the changes in the transport regulations. Um, as we move through that process, it became increasingly clear that there were some elements of the, of the changes in the regulations that were gonna be a real challenge to adjust to. You know, we have a very large country and, you know, there are occasions when, you know, livestock is transported for extended periods of time. And uh, one of the, the big contentious issue was, you know, related to the changes in the amount of time that you were allowed to, to transport an animal without giving it some rest. So in the spring of this year, um, the Minister of Agriculture uh, put in a, a two-year delay in enforcement of the regulations related to feed, water, and rest requirements for the cattle industry. So there is a, 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 a grace period that extended that was extended to the cattle industry to allow for more time to adjust to the to the new regulations related to feed, water, and rest. And we'll talk about that later in the presentation. However, the rest of the regulations that relate to, you know, the way animals are handled and loaded and unloaded and, and the other things that we'll talk about are in effect and you need to be uh, cognizant of that. So who do the regulations apply to? Well, basically they, were, uh, they apply to anybody who directly or indirectly uh, has any part in the transportation of live animals. So if you own livestock, um, if you uh, buy livestock and, and you know, at some point, obviously if they change hands, you're gonna move those animals, they're gonna be transported and anybody involved in that process is uh, you know, responsible to make sure that uh, that transportation is done appropriately and within the, the rules and regulations of, of the, the Health of Animals Act and the transport regulations. So, uh, you know, the animal owner, uh, regardless of whether the animal owner is present when the animal is moved, you know, a producer, uh, a buyer, an exporter, or an importer, uh, the person who actually transports the animal, the, the truck driver, the person that operates the airplane, if they're being moved by air or by sea, they would, they would be responsible. The people that handle the animals during the loading and unloading process, and anybody who receives those animals at any kind of assembly center, auction yard, 
uh, stockyards, holding facilities, and, and abattoirs are impacted by these regulations. And then something we don't really see in the Maritimes, but we probably will do in the future is, you know, anybody that operates a station where animals are fed, water, and rested um, in compliance with the transportation regulations would be obviously impacted by the transport regulations. So where does the regulatory authority for these regulations begin and end? Well, basically, you know, these regulations are enforced by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency or any of their agents. All aspects of transport uh, um, are, are regulated. And it also relates to the, the process of confining the animals prior to loading or as process, prior to the loading process and unloading. So when you start thinking about transport, I mean, that process starts when you decide or you select the animals uh, for transport. You have to make sure that they're fit for transport and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, then you also have to think about, you know, when those animals were last fed and watered and given the opportunity to rest prior to moving them. And then, you know, how you're gonna feed and water and rest them both during the, the, the transport period, if it's longer than the allowable transport times, or when you uh, unload them and, and get them off the truck and at their final destination. Um, you also have to think about handling for loading and unloading. The actual transport period when the animals are on the, the vehicle that's moving them, typically, you know, the trucking process. And, uh, you know, when you get them to their destination, you have to think about the post-transport process, you know, giving them access to feed and water and, and allowing them to rest. I think it's appropriate at this point to, to point out that, you know, when they start talking about transport times, those times actually begin when you start loading the cattle. So if you're bringing cattle in from pasture, or you're taking them from the barn and putting them onto a truck, the, the actual transport process starts when you start to gather them or you take them out of the environment that they were in to begin with. So if you're you know, gathering you know, cattle to, from a pasture to, to load on a truck, you know, technically that transport period starts when you start to round those cattle up and it doesn't end until those cattle meet, meet their final destination and they're unloaded and they're fed and watered again. So if you think about that, you know, when you start talking or thinking about handling your cattle for loading, you know, you need to, to, to build that into the process. And if you're, you know, looking at a fairly significant transport period after you get, you know, you load the cattle and you are taking them off pasture, then you might want to, you know, do the, the gathering one day, sort the cattle, and then pen them up with feed and water, and then load them the next day. You know, as long as they have the appropriate rest time and they've got access to feed and water, then you can start the clock again on the transport process. So the CFIA inspectors or, or employees are you know, responsible for enforcement of the, the new transport regulations. And incidentally, the old ones that existed prior to these. So they, they can uh, you know, conduct inspections at routine uh, locations, strategic locations. So you know, we've probably all seen CFIA inspectors at the stockyards. So one of the places that they're gonna be doing, you know, watching to see what's going on with regard to these regulations, obviously is the auction marts and, and stockyards and, and abattoirs. Um, and they certainly have the, the regulatory authority to, to look at what you're doing and inspect your load. They also have the regulatory authority to, to stop and conduct an inspection at any time that you're transporting these animals. So, you know, if you're at Tim Hortons and you got your truck parked and, and an inspector comes along, then legally they have the right to, to ask you what you've been doing, you know, how long those cattle have been on the road and, and have a look at them. So. You know, they have a lot of power and, uh, you know, they have that power for a reason so they can do the inspections and, and make sure that the regulations and the requirements of those regulations are respected. So 
I think one of the biggest things that, that the new regulations actually bring to play is that uh, they talk about the assessment of the animals or the fitness of the animals for transport. Um, and it clearly defines that or, or says that an animal has to be fit for transport before it can be loaded. Uh, the regulations require that you monitor the animals during transport and that you have to check the animals to make sure that they remain in good condition. If an animal, you know, for some reason gets injured during transport or its condition changes, then you're responsible for making sure that, uh, you know, you, you take appropriate action and if necessary, get that animal immediately to a place where it can be treated. And, uh, you know, the timing and monitoring of, uh, you know, when you check the animals during transport really is dependent on a, a couple of things. One obviously is the weather. So in hot weather or particularly cold weather, you're probably gonna more frequently uh, check the animals to make sure that their condition is remaining good. Uh, you may also have to check an animal more frequently depending on its age or its condition. So if you are you know, transporting some animals that are compromised, and we'll talk about compromised animals in a minute, then those animals will require um, kind of more frequent uh, checks than ones that are really healthy. Um, you know, if you've got a bunch of older cull cows, you know, those animals are probably not gonna travel quite as well as a bunch of really healthy feeder steers that uh, you know, are gonna be in better physical condition. So they, those steers probably wouldn't require as much uh, checking as an older cow. So Amy, I'm gonna to to take a break here for a second because I need to get the list of, um, list of conditions that I forgot to get out of my briefcase. That. So, once we start looking at animals and trying to determine whether they're appropriate for transport, there's two clear, clearly different or groups of animals that the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and the transport regulations are interested in. And, uh, you know, those are the animals that are targeted uh, specifically with, with separate regulations. Um, and those are compromised animals or unfit animals. So compromised animals are animals that uh, you're gonna require some extra uh, supervision, but if you follow the rules, you can transport these animals. Uh, unfit animals are ones that, uh, you know, the regulations just don't permit you to transport. And, uh, you know, they're, they're those animals that there's no way they can be moved or, or handled without creating you know, undue pain and suffering to them. So if we look at uh, compromised animals, the regulations require that those animals must be isolated on the truck. In other words, they have to be in their own compartment. They must be loaded individually and unloaded individually, and they're not allowed to be moved up ramps inside a truck. So if you're moving them on a tractor trailer, basically they have to be in the compartment at the back of the trailer. Um, you know, and obviously if you're gonna put them on that trailer, they're gonna have to go up a ramp on the inside, on the outside of the truck, but they're not permitted to be moved through the truck into a further area. They need to be on the back of the truck. You have to make a, you know, a real effort or they require, you know, very careful uh, handling to prevent further injury or death. And certainly you have to make sure that you really limit the, any amount of suffering. They just have to be handled very carefully. They need to be, or they must be directed, transported directly to the nearest place other than an assembly yard. Um, where they can receive care or be humanely slaughtered. So basically these animals, they can be taken to a veterinarian. Um, 
for care or they have to uh, go to, a, to an abattoir where they're going to be um, humanely slaughtered. They cannot have be unloaded and offloaded at a, an auction yard or any place on their way. And the maximum amount of time that these animals can be put on a truck and moved uh, without feed and water is 12 hours. So if one of these animals continues or gets worse during transport, they would be considered unfit for transport. And, uh, you know, they would have to be um, really quickly taken to a place where they can be uh, appropriately looked after. Unfit animals are, in, are animals that have any condition that leads to suffering during transport and they're not to be transported. So let's go back to the compromised animals. So the regulations have a fairly extensive uh, list of uh, conditions um, that would limit their transport and classify them as um, unfit. Um, so in terms of compromised animals, any animal that shows, that's bloated, that shows no sign of discomfort would be considered compromised. Animals with acute frostbite, an animal that's blind in both eyes, an animal that's not healed fully after a procedure, including dehorning, detusking, or castration. Um, lame, other than described in the unfit category. So these are animals that are, they're, they're walking and they're showing some sign of lameness, but if they're really lame, then they fall into the unfit classification. It has a deformity, deformity or a fully healed amputation. So if you know, there's some kind of injury that's, that's very significant, but healed, then they would still, they, they could qualify as being compromised. An animal that's in peak lactation, um, an animal that's unhealed or acutely injured its penis, rectal or a, a minor rectal or minor vaginal prolapse, any animal that's been limited in its mobility because of the use of advice, a, a device. So if you've got an animal that's hobbled, um, it would fall into the, the compromise situation. Wet birds, which don't really apply to cattle, but you know, obviously you need to think about that as well. Um, has any other signs of infirmity or illness, injury or condition that indicates that an animal has a reduced capacity to withstand transport? So that's kind of a, the catchphrase that they put at the end of the, the the whole description of a compromised animal. And I think when we start talking about compromised and unfit animals, you know, we really need to kind of think about whether or not as a producer, you're comfortable, you know, loading these animals. And if there's any concerns that you have, then you probably really need to assess whether or not you should be loading the animal at all. And, uh, you know, your own comfort with the situation, I think is the sort of the, the, the test that, you know, really um, might determine whether or not you're, you're gonna go any further. So those are compromised animals and you can transport them, but you have to do it with regard to the regulations or the considerations that I pointed out earlier. So if we're talking about the next or the, the, the level of, of, you know, kind of um, challenge that the animal has to be moved, um, you know, we, we mix the, the class that we can't, we can no longer transport or animals that are considered unfit for tra transportation. And an animal is defined as being unfit are likely to suffer during transport. They can't be loaded or transported unless they're going for veterinary care. And I would suggest if you're gonna do that, you wanna have instructions from the veterinarian. And any of these animals, would be considered unfit for transport. And this is kind of the list that's written in the regulations. So any animal that's non-ambulatory is unfit for transport. 
an animal that has a fracture that impedes its mobility, is lame in one or more limbs to the extent that it exhibits signs of pain or suffering or a halted movement or is reluctant to walk, an animal that's in shock or is dying, a severe prolapse of the uterus, rectal or vaginal areas, signs of generalized nervous disorder, stressed hogs, uh, so porcine that is trembling or having trouble breathing and or has discolored skin, any animal that's showing lab labored breathing, severe open wounds, hobble to aid in tre treatment of an injury, any animal that's showing signs of dehydration, signs of hypothermia or hypothermia, so an animal that's excessively hot or cold, an animal that's showing signs of fever, has a large hernia, an animal that's in the last 10% of its gestation or has given birth in the preceding 48 hours, an animal that's got an unhealed or infected navel, any animal that's got a gangrenous udder, severe cancer eye, bloat with discomfort or weakness, signs of exhaustion, or an animal that's extremely thin or in really, as you know, that's in, bed, in poor body condition or very poor body condition. And then the catchphrase that they have at the, at the end of the list that, you know, gives them the option of looking at other things is has, has any signs of affirm, infirmity, illness, injury, or a condition that indicates an animal cannot be transported without suffering. So I said earlier, as I said earlier, um, if you're uncomfortable or you think that there's any reason why you shouldn't, you know, load this animal, you probably shouldn't be loading it. Um, you know, because it is, you know, if you're concerned about it to the point that you're thinking about whether or not it should be loaded, there's obviously something wrong with it that would fall into the compromised and unfit category. And I think moving forward, you know, at the end of the day, you know, these are animals that, you know, they're either not going to do very well in transport, or if you go to sell them, you're probably, you know, going to, when they get to the abattoir, they're likely not going to make it through the grading system. So there's no point in stressing these animals, putting, you know, causing them pain and suffering by transport. It's just not an excusable thing to do. So, you know, we really need to make sure that these animals aren't transported and that, you know, we either get them back to health on the farm or we euthanize them. It's, you know, the only kind of responsible thing um, to, to do. And it's also important to point out that this is a very significant part of the regulations. And that is, a, you know, um, an offense to continue to transport these animals uh, or, or to move them. Uh, if you have an animal that, that you know, was compromised when you load it and it becomes unfit, then you really need to uh, make sure that you get that animal to the nearest place as quickly as you can to, to give it, you know, to look after it properly. So these regulations also require that people have training um, and that they understand the regulations and, you know, participating in this, uh, this you know, discussion today is, is a start in terms of training. So the, the regulations require that every person who has anything to do with transportation, whether they load the animals, they herd them, um, you know, to, to get them ready, you know, and sort them for transport. The people who are actually transporting the animals, whether they're driving the trucks or, or uh, you know, loading them into a ship. Um, you know, everybody has to have a general knowledge of the regulations, understand those regulations and understand how they're gonna look after the animals that are in their care and make sure that the regulations are respected. So an average producer, you know, you need to understand what the regulations are and if there's an opportunity to take some training, you know, it's important that you do that. If you're trucking or, or moving animals for commercial purposes, in other words, if you're getting paid to do that, then the, 
the requirement for training is is more stringent. And uh, you know, if you happen to own a trucking company, then you're also responsible for your employees and making sure that uh, you know they're trained. And uh, you know, people who are running stockyards or assembly yards, they're also responsible for making sure that everybody that works for them is trained. So this training has to include, you know, an understanding of animal behavior, um, an understanding of how to assess an animal's fitness for transport. And you, know, you have to be able to determine whether an animal is fit for transport, whether it's compromised or whether it's unfit for transport. You should have uh, training that, that, is, that includes animal handling. You need to uh, understand the process of contingency planning. So if you're a commercial trucker, the assumption is that you're gonna be moving animals you know, into provincially or for longer periods of time. So with regard to that, you, know, you need to be able to determine what you're gonna do if your truck breaks down or you, know, you get caught in a snowstorm. All of those things are part of the contingency planning process. And you, know, you also, if as an individual producer, you need to think about these things also. Um, you need to understand the process of monitoring the, the livestock while you're loading and unloading to make sure that that's done properly. And uh, you know, your employees need to be, to understand that process and know what to look for. Um, you need to understand, you know, how to uh, to drive your truck properly, and and uh, the starting and stopping process, and and uh, also, you know, monitoring those animals during movement, as I said earlier, unloading and and uh, you know, supervising the unloading should be part of that training, and you need to understand the risk factors involved in in moving cattle and how those factors change with the weather and uh, you know, temperature, the condition of the animals, their production stages, their age, and, and the other things that are associated with whether or not an animal becomes fit or unfit for transport. And lastly, they have to, you need to make sure that your, your people that are working for you or yourself as a commercial trucker understand the regulations. So there's a, an entity called the Canadian Animal Transport Association, and they offer training for commercial truckers. And this training includes, uh, you know, can, can include classroom or online training. And they provide certification for commercial transporters. And I'd certainly encourage, you know, if you're a commercial transporter to consider doing this training, I think, you know, if you're going outside the Maritimes, you probably already run into it. In Western Canada, you know, their commercial truckers have been certified for a number of years. And, uh, you know, it's going to become, if it's not already a regulation for you, it certainly will be. And these regulations require you to, to have, to be able to demonstrate that you've had transport training. So, um, you know, you need to consider looking into this. So <clears throat> moving further into the regulations, there are some specific classes of animals that have special regulations related to them. So livestock less than eight days of age, um, whether they're cattle, uh, cervids or camelids, so deer and elk and llamas. Um, any one of those animals and sheep and pigs. Um, so any one of those animals that's less than eight days of age or younger, uh, they have a special set of regulations that are related to them. And uh, they shall not be transported unless you follow these regulations. So they must be loaded and unloaded individually without negotiating a ramp within a trailer, similar to compromised animals. They must be able to lay down without uh, laying on one another. So there has to be enough space within the truck that they can lay down comfortably without kind of touching each other. You obviously have to prevent any suffering, injury or death during transporting. 
they have to be segregated from other animals that are not, you know, that are over eight days of age. So basically they have to be in a compartment by themselves on the back of the trailer. You're not allowed to transport them for more than 12 hours. And that transportation uh, begins with the loading of the first animal. So if you stop and you pick up a bob calf at a dairy farm, you have 12 hours to get that whole load from that point to wherever you're going to unload them. And you're not allowed to uh, stop during transportation um, other than to load other animals that are late, less than eight days of age or less. So um, you're basically allowed to load your trailer. Uh, you're only allowed to stop and load other young animals under eight days. And then when you want, the only place you're allowed to unload them is at their final destination, um, which cannot be an assembly yard. So then we move to the next classification, which basically they, they call young ruminants. So a young ruminant is defined as any ruminant animal that's not been weaned. So it has to, you know, it's considered weaned when it's no longer drinking milk and it can be fed ex exclusively on hay or, and grain. So these animals uh, are not to be transported unless the expected time between beginning of loading and the end of loading is not more than 12 hours. So you can load them, move them for 12 hours, then they have to be unloaded and, uh, and rested. So in addition to that, no person shall reload a young ruminant after it's unloaded at its final destination. So you have to take these animals um, from wherever you pick them up to their final destination. And that's where they need to stay. <clears throat> so in terms of, you know, all of the different classifications of cattle and sheep and, and other animals, um, under the previous act, uh, transportation regulations, there were requirements or limitations on how far and how long we could uh, transport an animal. Under the new regulations, these times have um, been decreased. And in some cases, you know, previously there were no regulations. So under the old act, there wasn't any real definition of compromised animals. So there was no uh, limitation on the time that they could be transported. As I stated earlier, you know, you can't transport a compromised animal for more than 12 hours. And then at that point, it has to be unloaded, fed, watered, and rested, or, and actually it can't be reloaded because it is considered compromised until it no longer is compromised. In other words, it's healed. So if we start looking at adult ruminants, so um, beef cows, dairy cows, um, and uh, sheep, under the own regulations, you could transport them for 48 hours. The current requirements limit the transport to 36 hours. When we start talking about horses and pigs, you know, the previous regulations allowed 36 hours of transport. That's been reduced to 28 hours. All other animals are, you know, previously were 36 hours, but that's not really been changed. But I do expect not too many of us are probably going to be transporting, you know, zoo animals. Young ruminants that aren't weaned. Uh, previously, you were technically allowed to transport them for 18 hours. That's been reduced to 12 hours. And then in addition to that, once you meet your or exceed uh, your travel times, allowable transport times without feed, water, and rest, you, know, you have to rest those animals and give them access to feed and water for eight hours, whereas previously, the requirement was for five hours. So when we're considering these travel times, we also have to think about, you know, the actual hours of service that a trucker is allowed to work and sell. And these regulations don't stop because of hours of service. So if a trucker is entitled to say 
you know, work an additional 10 hours from the time that he loads her cattle and is required to stop after that 10 hours and rest. Your cattle, if they're stopped and they're not being watered and fed on that trailer, are still considered to be in transport. So at any hours that that, that trucker has to rest because of his hours of service regulations build up in your transport time. So in terms of moving cattle into Ontario from the Maritimes, for instance, you know, if the cattle, the, you've got one driver on the truck and you've got uh, you know, 36 hours to move those, those animals, in theory, you know, it is possible for a commercial trucker to do that with one person on the truck and obey his hours of service. But the likelihood is, you know, moving forward, you're going to, we're going to be looking at putting two drivers on one of these trucks, unless you want to, you know, stop and unload the cattle and then rest them for eight hours and, and reload them. And we don't really have any stations between here and, and uh, Ontario to do that. So, you know, it's, it's going to present some issues in terms of moving cattle commercially. Now, if, Unfortunately, this year, nobody's going to be going to the Royal Winter Fair because it's been canceled. But if you're trucking your own cattle and you planned on stopping for the night somewhere on the way and, and going into a hotel, then as long as you water and rest the cattle and, and feed them on your, your own stock trailer, then the time that you're stopped, assuming that it is in fact eight hours that you're stopped would be considered the rest period to feed and water and then they can comfortably lay down which you know if you're moving purebred show stock you're probably going to do that anyway so <clears throat> from the perspective of someone that wants to show cattle you know these regulations can be you know you can you can work with them and, and it's not going to present you a huge problem so the regulations are also quite specific or, or talk to you about uh, handling animals and certainly they clearly indicate that it's not acceptable to cause any form of suffering or injury or you know, conceivably death while you're handling the animals, whether you're loading, unloading, or you know, you've got them in transport. And that's very clearly identified as being an issue in the regulations. So they, you need, and that's you know, you need to make sure that your staff or anybody working for you recognizes that too. There are limitations on the, the use of a you know, stock prod. Um, you're not allowed to use them on livestock that's less than three months of age. You're also clearly, you know, there's a pro prohibition on using them on sheep. If you're going to use a stock prod, you have to make sure that there's the opportunity for the animal to move forward freely. So, you know, if you're trying to turn the the cow around and there's no place in front of her to move, then you know you you need to get her turned around before you you actually use the prod on her because she has to have a clear way to move ahead. And you're not allowed to use the stock prod in any sensitive areas like the the stomach, the anal region, any genital regions or on the face of the animal. <clears throat> when we start loading the the, the, the cattle. And uh, we talk about space requirements and overcrowding. You know, the regulations are really kind of outcome based. In other words, they, they're not necessarily prescriptive, um, but they, they want to achieve certain outcomes. So, you know, wherever you load the cattle or whatever, you know, um, you know trailer or, or uh, area that you put them into, they have to have enough roof space to accommodate them to stand in their normal standing position. So if you, you know, they, they have to be able to hold their head in a normal position and stand in a normal position. So you have to make sure there's enough ceiling height to do that. And if you have a, you know, a big horse that holds its head up, then you need to make sure there's room in the trailer for that horse to be able to do that. Um, <clears throat> They must not be overcrowded, and the animals have to be able to maintain their their preferred standing position 
And they also need to be able to um, adjust their body position, position to allow them to regain their footing if they should happen to stumble. So if the cattle or, or sheep or any animal is crowded, excessively crowded in the truck, they're not always able to, you know, move themselves around so they can get their feet underneath themselves. And, you know, if they do happen to fall, then they're probably going to get injured in the truck because they'll be, you know, there's, it creates excitement and they're trying to find their footing and, you know, it's all of those things will probably lend to a bad outcome. So that that's important. The cattle have enough room in the truck so that they can, you know, compensate for the movement in the truck and keep themselves in a good standing position. And if, you know, for some reason they happen to go down, then they should, they need to be able to regain their footing and get back up again, which they can't do if they're overcrowded. And that's a critical reason for why you, you want to be monitoring the, the livestock during transport to make sure that if an animal does go down, that you know it can get back up and, and get uh, stay stay on its feet or stay in a position where it's not going to get hurt. You need to prevent hypothermia or hypothermia. So you know you're going to adjust the loading density of the truck depending on the temperature and uh, you know, the, the condition of the animals. And, uh, you know, when it's particularly cold, you're probably gonna wanna reduce the airflow compared to when it's uh, very hot. And in conditions when it is very hot um, or humid, you know, reducing the stocking density in the truck is, uh, is absolutely critical to make, make sure that the animals stay healthy during transport. So there are charts available that you know, will tell you how many pounds per square feet of cattle that you can put on a truck based on the, the temperature and, and the, the weather conditions. And you know, those are available to you and I encourage you to look at those and actually figure out what, your, what is an appropriate loading density for your, your particular truck. So the other big thing that's a, a big change in these regulations is that you know, you have to consider transport of care. Well, a lot of you are probably going to ask you, you know, what, what do you mean by that? So, you know, in terms of the chain of responsibility for animal welfare during transport, it begins with the owner or the agent of those, the person who's responsible for those cattle, and it extends to the final delivery of the animal and that person that receives the animal. And certainly, you know, the welfare of those animals is a joint responsibility of everybody that's in, been involved in the transportation or associated with it, as I've already stated. So when you get there, an animal to its final destination and you're unloading it, the person who receives those animals is responsible for those animals when they've acknowledged the receipt, receipt of those animals and they, they've documented that. So if you're delivering an animal to a, a, an auction, you know, it's your responsibility to make sure that the person who receives those cattle or, or sheep, um, you know, accepts the, the delivery of those animals and that you have documentation for it. And uh, they sign a, a, a piece of paper saying that they received them. And as a transporter, um, you're still responsible for those animals until that, that you're receiving them has been you know, documented and acknowledged by the, the person that receives them. So you have to make sure that uh, that care and, and responsibility for those animals is, is accepted by the person who receives them. And part of that process is gonna be making sure that you have a manifest and have someone sign off for those animals. So there's responsibilities in terms of record keeping. So this says uh, any commercial carrier or any person transporting an animal in the course of business, including farmers, you know, you have to keep a record of each shipment. So that record, you know, needs to include the, the name of the person that's trucking the animals and, and then receiving them. You should head include in that document the last time that the animal was fed, watered, and rested prior to being loaded, the date and time that it was loaded, and the place where the animal was, was taken or its final destination. 
And then you also need to, you know, once you have those records, you're required to maintain those records for two years in case someone wants to check them at a later date. Um, if you're interested in finding out more information about the health of animals transport regulations, there's all kinds of, you know, the documents are actually online at uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And then there's uh, guidance documents that, you know, have kind of question and answer scenarios in them. And uh, there's a heck of a lot of information available out there. Um, in terms of the code of practice for transportation of animals, the National Farm Animal Care Council has got information on their website. And if you're interested in further training, um, the Canadian Livestock Transportation Association, you know, it has a website and their training is available online. And certainly if there was enough interest, there is the potential of, of bringing a trainer to the Maritimes and doing some training. So it's, uh, there's a lot of information out there, and uh, I guess I didn't include my contact information, but if you go to the Perennial website um, uh, you, and look under our staff section, you'll find my contact information there, and I'd be more than happy to, to try and answer any questions that you might have related to this presentation or transportation regulations. And uh, it's unfortunate, but I uh, wasn't be able to, we, we weren't able to, to join you as part of a, a you know, a face-to-face -face meeting. But, uh, you know, I hope that this uh, has helped to answer some of the questions that you might have related to the transportation of animals and the new regulations.